Really excited to have Frankie Palmieri coming on this episode, vocalist from Amur, the founder of Amur, and really the last remaining member, original member of Amur, and we'll probably get into that during the show. Uh, But before we do, I want to tell you guys about Ned. I wonder if Frankie has used CBD. He seems like the type of guy who has. He's always on to new things. Maybe I'll have to ask him during the episode if we get to it. But Ned has been excellent. Um, CBD has become extremely popular in the past year as the market becomes saturated. It's become more and more difficult to navigate and choose the right company and product. And that's really where Ned comes in. I talked to the two founders on the phone with Chris, Adrian, and Rhett. And here's the thing. I have tried so far the 300 dosage, um, because I'm going to look at the website right now just to make sure I'm getting this right in terms of the dosages. Yeah, so the 300 milligram, I think people are probably going to go to the website sometimes and see that 1500. I can't talk about the 1500 yet, and it's got to be intense. I just haven't tried it yet. But the 300, man, I've had some awesome results, uh, and we'll get right into that and let you guys know a little bit more about CBD if you haven't heard us talk about it already at length. Uh, but Ned does not cut corners nor spare expense when it comes to CBD production. Ned is a wellness brand offering science-backed and nature-based solutions that offer an alternative to prescription and over-the-counter drugs. You know, you hear about guys at the VA being prescribed antidepressants, opioids, and I know at times these are necessary for some guys, but the unfortunate thing is some people who could be using alternatives getting hooked on things that they shouldn't be, and it leads them down a dark path. And you've heard Chris talk about it. We're really just happy to have Ned on board and offer an alternative to that type of stuff. No isolates or synthetic ingredients, full transparency. Ned shares third-party lab reports. They share who farms their products and their extraction process all right there on their site. Now, just to give you some of the benefits of CBD, it's a sleep aid, also used to treat insomnia. Let me say for myself, uh, I know for some people they take CBD during the day. I personally have enjoyed taking that right before I go to sleep uh, because I do start to get that sleepy feeling immediately after and have a really great night slept every time that I've taken it. And you really feel like you're, uh, you know, although you don't get high, you kind of feel your head in the clouds type of thing, and you feel like you're uh, you're sleeping on a cloud. I just I've I've had the best night's sleep on this stuff. Uh, it's an anti-inflammatory, a natural pain reliever, and it's also used to treat anxiety and PTSD, as I mentioned earlier. Used to treat depression, and it's a rich source of antioxidants, really important in your nutrition. And it's also being used now in the treatment of serious chronic conditions such as epilepsy, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and more. So this is a great alternative to get people started with. And most important, NED products are going to really benefit our audience for guys that are having post-traumatic stress issues, coming back from deployments, or also having sleep issues, anything of that sort. Once again, NED will not get you high. It's a full-spectrum hemp that is not a psychotropic, meaning it will not get you high once again, non-psychotropic. NED products contain a minuscule amount of THC, less than 0.3%, as allowed by law. You've heard Chris tell you all the benefits that he's seen And I'm loving it as well. I mean, they also have women's products on there and they have the body butter, which I've actually been using on my knuckles and stuff because as a lifter and in this cold weather, they tend to get really dry and then start cracking and bleeding. So like every morning I've been putting that on my knuckles, on my hands, making sure that uh, I prevent that type of stuff in this cold New York weather. So if you want to check out Ned and try CBD, we have a special offer for the Battleline audience. Go to helloned.com slash battle line or you could just go to helloned.com and enter battle line at checkout for 15 percent off your first order plus free shipping that's h-e-l-l-o-n-e-d.com slash battle line to get 15 percent off your first order plus free shipping thank you ned i also of course cannot forget about our friends at fort scott munitions chris uses fort scott on all of his tactical training courses with Battle Line Tactical, which is how I got the name for the show. So you can't say that I came up with the name for the show. It's Chris's name. I, I know Chris in other episodes has been like, that's Ian's genius coming up with the name of Battle Line Podcast from Battle Line Tactical. No, he came up with the name. I stole it because I think it's a great name. Fort Scott is a manufacturer, once again, a multi-federal patented solid copper and brass CNC spun ammunition that is designed to tumble upon impact. That's their trademark. 
in soft tissue. What that means leaves devastating wound channels for faster bleed out and quicker incapacitation. You can learn more about actually the tumble upon impact on their website, which we'll get into. Uh, this ammunition was originally developed to innovate and improve on the standard of military grade ammunition design. It was found that not only did that TUI outperform competitors in the self defense industry, but it quickly became apparent that it would be a top contender for hunters alike. With the ammunition being CNC spun, the tolerances are some of the tightest on the market, ensuring that you receive the same results with each pull of the trigger. Really important, you need something that's going to be consistent. Fort Scott Munitions is available throughout privately owned businesses in all 50 states, as well as directly online through fortscottmunitions.com. That's F-O-R-T-S-C-O-T-T. M-U-N-I-T-I-O-N-S dot com. Once again, F-O-R-T-S-C-O-T-T-M-U-N-I-T-I-O-N-S dot com. And if you want to learn more about Tumble Upon Impact, you can go to their site. They have demonstration videos really showing you what their ammunition is capable of. Anything you want to order off the site, use our exclusive promo code BATTLELINE for 15% off your order only available to listeners of the Battleline podcast. Fort Scott Munitions is a proud supporter once again of Chris Peranto, Battleline Tactical, and the Battleline podcast. And the reason they've been staying on board with us is they've been seeing great results from advertising with us, and the audience is just loving it. So we're so proud to have them on board. With that, let's get right over to Frankie Palmieri from Amur. On the microphones, pure and uncensored American straight talk. Never quit. You're locked and loaded with Chris Peranto and Ian Scotto. This is the Battle Line Podcast. Get the fuck! So on Battle Line Podcast for the first time, and yes, I know for the audience, Chris Peranto is out for this one. He had some uh, stuff to do at the VA. And honestly, there's just someone I've wanted to interview forever, and I just haven't had the forum to do it in, until now, really. Frankie Palmieri from Amur. And the crazy thing, dude, is I was thinking about this. I don't know if it feels like this long for you. It certainly doesn't for me. I met you nine years ago, bro. It feels like it's longer than that. But yeah, really? We've known each other for a long time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we grew up in the same neighborhood, so I feel like we've always in, been in proximity in some degree. So, Yeah, yeah. Well, I, you were in Queens. I grew up in Manhasset, so it's, it's you know, very close. But it's kind of two yeah. different worlds at the same time. Uh, but yeah, I, yeah, for sure. I was thinking about it. I met you on the Solar Flare Homicide video shoot. And the first conversation I ever had with you was about sleepwalking and sleep paralysis and all different stuff. And I, I think sometimes you just meet people and you connect on a certain level. And I think a lot of people were there talking about the band and you were there on a video shoot for hours on end. And we're kind of interested in talking about other fascinating things, I guess. Uh, yeah, I mean, for sure. I love like, you know, talking about uh, any anything that seems strange and unusual i guess um but yeah i mean, I, I remember that day for sure yeah and, and it's like song still holds up love that album but uh the, the first thing i was going to ask you about when i texted you because it's been a while since i've even hit you up or anything you were saying you're yeah. like hey i'm glad that you uh you hit me up because of certain things that you're working on and and i just wanted you to expand on that yeah, I've just been kind of doing a lot of different uh, reading and kind of doing the whole 360, how can I put this, uh, self-evaluation, you know, mentally, physically, spiritually. And so I kind of came to this conclusion that I, I really only exist through the connections I've made, you know, in this life, you know, uh, whether they be, what, regardless of how strong they are, the, the people that I'm tethered to are what make my time here on this earth, you know, actually means something. So I've just kind of been working on strengthening a lot of bonds that I have and reconnecting with people that maybe I uh, ignored that, again, that's the simple concept that, you know, these people are what makes uh, my life, uh, you know, worth living in a way. So, um, you know, just kind of expanding on that as best I can for you, but just kind of come, I just came to that place recently where I just like, that's become very important to me, you know? Yeah, and I understand it because you're someone I probably see once a year. It's, it's, but at the same time, I still consider you a good friend because sometimes 
you connect with people on a certain level that you don't see all the time. And when you see them again, it's like it, it's it's like time hasn't really passed, as we were saying before. And the, I don't even know where you're actually living at or anything right now, but you're a guy who's like constantly on tour. So I understand it. Uh, yeah, I, right now I'm actually planted in Dallas, Texas. I've been here for about a month and I'll be here for another six, seven weeks, just, uh, been doing nothing but pretty much training and reading and studying and just again, focusing completely on myself and just kind of, uh, reinventing how my mind and body feels you know so that's does, been my does, whole uh, mission right now does that have anything to do with the music like is the new album done i've heard the first song it's excellent and, and by the way i came into this interview with uh you asked for it i usually have fails by jinx but i was like we got to do some of your <laughs> and then that song is just so powerful such a great intro song so i was like we got to use that but it does it have anything to do with the writing process because i've heard you talk about your writing process that you have to go into a pretty dark state in order to write an amir album yeah i find that my best writing in terms of content for the band uh lyrically and emotionally comes from when i'm looking downward when i when i don't really see any light and i'm kind of just completely wrapped in all the negative uh, aspects of, you know, what, what I experienced, the, the human experience as a whole. Um, but, uh, you know, I wouldn't say this relates to that because I'm not in a writing mode right now. I'm just kind of trying to prepare myself physically and mentally for the next album cycle. So that we're going to be hitting the road pretty hard this year and, uh, hopefully next year the same thing. So I'm just kind of like reconstructing my, my mind and body right now because I just kind of like, uh, you know, I had the time now to really focus on myself. So that's really it. But um, in terms of the album being done, I, I, it's like, 50, it's like 50, 50. Like we're almost there. Like we have, we do have an album, but we're, we're cherry, we're very, very specific and cherry picking, um, you know, what it is we actually want to put out in terms of content. So we're slowly tripping it out. We're, we're, our plan is still to get the album out by the end of the year, but we're still kind of in this like uh, creative process in terms of getting what we think is the strongest stuff out there for the people you know so. i'm surprised to hear end of the year because you already put a song out and it, they, the year just started yeah yeah well we have again we have the content done we've been recording and everything we, we have a bunch of stuff um we're still kind of working out some, some things with the album again in terms of content like what music we actually want to release what we want people to hear what, what becomes the attitude and um total overall vibe of the album that that just really hasn't been accomplished yet so that song we put out is just kind of a taste of what the album sounds like um sonically and you know what people can expect in terms of energy but um there's a lot more to be shared and experienced uh in terms of you know music. so it's slowly coming there yeah i, I want to get i wanted to get into kind of the changes from the last album actually from previously and then into the last album, because it just seems to me as someone who has talked with you, someone who's seen interviews you've done over the years that you kind of lost a passion for what you were doing at one point because of the guys that you were working with. And then when you reformed an entire new lineup of the band, it really reinvigorated your love for this. Yeah. I mean, there were all kinds of things that internally were wrong with the band. I mean, one of them, I think, I think honestly, one of the biggest issues was just my attitude overall, the way I looked at things, my, how I approached a lot of things within the band creatively and personally in hindsight, uh, were, were not always the best foot forward. You know, I think there were a lot of opportunities I had to make things better but there were also moments where things just worked against me creatively, where you know, I didn't see eye to eye with people on the music or, you know, or we would make an album and we, I would be kind of battling with the, the idea of having like a bunch of songs I thought were good. And then a bunch of songs that I always thought like were kind of like, you know, B sides or whatever, but the rest of the band might've been excited about. So I always had this hard time, like being completely uh, how can I put this? I'm completely excited about what we were doing, mm -hmm. you know, because I, I always again had the creative dispute or personal dispute at some level. And then when uh, you know, there was a mass ex exodus of the band in 2015, and I got the new lineup, I was kind of able to start fresh and with a new perspective 
and a new attitude towards things. And also getting to work with Josh was such a breath of fresh air because he actually would listen to my ideas, you know, rather than kind of, kind of opening an ear and then just shutting it off. He was very interested to see what I brought to the table in terms of, you know, writing goes. So, um, everything about it became a better snare for me personally. Again, looking back, I think that uh, I probably could have made a better situation out of all the other times that I've been doing this for so long and all the other old band members I've had and stuff like that. But you, you grow and learn at your own pace. So I'm not mad about anything that transpired. But yeah, to kind of go back to what you were saying specifically, yeah, the um, the new lineup and having this, this new energy around me definitely kind of rebirthed like my uh, my interest in, in you know, the entire thing, you know. Uh, so I think that really shows in that last release we did that came out three years ago now. Yeah, yeah it, it definitely does. And, and it's interesting because it sounds like you regret certain actions, but at the same time, I, like, I don't know if this goes into everything happening for a reason type thing, because you're way happier with this lineup. You put out the best album that you have in years. And had things have not demised the way that they did, you wouldn't have had what you do now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I don't look at it like I wish it didn't happen. I'm glad it all happened. I'm glad I made all those mistakes because I, I won't repeat them now. But, um, you know, just to, just to kind of affirm what you're saying though yeah there's definitely been like a resurgence for me personally and my passion for the band and and wanting this to you know go well and just just being ex excited about the music i mean the music to me is everything you know if, if i'm not excited about the music then i'm not excited about anything you know like every, we could be could be doing the biggest tour and this and that and all the other you know little fancy things that come being having a music career but if I don't, if I'm not feeling the jams and you know, what's the point? So yeah. it, it all starts and ends there with me. And this last record being me personally being such a fan of it really just helps the entire, you know, vibe, you know, every, in all directions. So, so I don't know if getting into this would be too personal and, you know, we do get pretty personal on this show. Uh, you know, Chris was hoping that he could have been here for this episode when I was telling him your story, but just to give you an example, you know, the way I linked up with Chris really is Chris is one of the guys who survived the Benghazi attack and he got thrown into the media after that and started getting called the conspiracy theorist for saying that those guys were told to stand down for 13 hours while they were under fire. Um, you know, and he does blame the the past administration, Hillary Clinton for stuff. And there was like a just barrage of attacks on Chris pretty shortly after meeting him. And he's been pretty open about this. Like he wrote an article a while back that, just the amount of negative attention he was getting at one point, he was suicidal. And he wrote about how he was at an airport one day, felt like he didn't want to be here anymore. And some older woman went up to him and said, hey, are you Tonto? And he was like, I wasn't even in the mood to talk to this woman, wasn't in the mood to talk to anybody. And he was like, yeah, I'm Tonto. And she said, hey, I, I love what you're saying. Keep speaking your truth. And he said, this woman doesn't know it. But like that right there, just that little gesture made me strive to keep going forward and and not give up on myself so uh, the transitioning to what i'm getting into i remember just as a fan of the band there was a really awkward period where it was like there were amir shows where you were not even singing for the band it was jay who we know from siler sing for certain shows when it's like you're the guy who writes most of the music it's your words it's your message and I remember at one point when everybody left, we had a conversation on the phone and you were like, I don't really know where I'm going from here. And I'd, I would kind of like to hear about it because I think it would inspire people in that like the band came back better than ever from that. And it's due to you not giving up on yourself and your dream. Yeah, I, I think that I've always had like this kind of I don't know what you call it. Uh, maybe maybe it might be a, a form of insanity, but I just refuse to give up you know, when on certain things, you know, and, and when I feel strongly about something and I, when I, when I want something bad enough, I'm willing to bleed out of my eyes for it. So, you know, obviously when everyone left, um, you know, when everyone quit or whatever, I was kind of left to be like, all right, well, what am I going to do now? Like, where do I go from here? Uh, but I don't know if we're referencing the same point in time. I think what you're talking about is when I lost my voice. Uh, yeah, around, because, but that was all the same the year yeah. probably, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I got lucky with that. You know, I was able to see the right doctors and kind of heal my voice. And then once I got healthy, uh, it just so happens that that was also the same time everyone decided to leave. 
So I was kind of sitting there and knowing what I was capable of and knowing what I wanted to accomplish and just being extremely vexed. And, uh, you know, again, like I said, like just, uh, just having this goal in my mind that I wanted so bad to accomplish, I just, uh, did whatever I had to do to make it happen. And I mean, I can bring you back to when, you know, I was basically, I did, all I did for 10 days straight was sit on my couch next to my phone, like making phone calls like all day, every day, like trying to piece the band back together, trying to figure out who's on my side, who's fucking with me. I remember my, my manager had dropped me at the time, like just being like, I don't want to be a part of this anymore. So like he stopped giving a shit. And then, uh, you know, I was just kind of by myself, you know, to figure it all out. And luckily I had built these other relationships, you know, along the way. And so when I had spoken to, uh, Josh Travis, who, who's still in the band now, uh, you know, I just was like, you know, look, this is what I want to do. This is what I see happening for us. If me and you can get together and make an album that's good enough, I think we can really do something really cool. And, um, you know, it all just kind of came to fruition. You know, thankfully, I, I was able to team up with some great people and it all just happened that way, you know, but it definitely comes from me just, you know, initially just being like, I don't want to say, I don't want to say like, I don't want to say fuck that. But it's like, fuck this. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I'm not like, like, I don't like, not that I don't care. I'm like, but like, fuck the situation. You know, like, I'm going to improve on this. You know, uh, I chose not to ignore, chose to be as uh, positive as I can about the whole thing. So yeah, it turned out for the best. You know, I, again, I'm way better place for many reasons, uh, you know, regardless of any kind of turmoil that it might've existed previously in my life. Uh, definitely way happier, way better position now, just overall, you know, because of everything that I've, I've been able to accomplish since then, you know. For sure. Were there any, uh, like, legal issues with the band name? And I ask this because I don't know if you listen to CKY, man. I'm a huge CKY fan. When I when I interviewed Darren, he was saying the only song he didn't fully write was Afterworld and that Chad Ginsburg wrote the hook or something, yet those guys have the rights to the name CKY and he's touring with a whole new band called 96 Bitter Beings. 96 Quite Bitter Things. Yeah, yeah and it's just weird that. to me in that, like, I saw them. They're excellent. They sound exactly like CKY because he is CKY to me. And it's kind of weird when these guys who didn't really have anything to do with the writing process get to have the rights to the name and the benefits that come with that. Uh, well, not that I really am interested to divulge too much of my situation, but I have no legal hangups in terms of anyone having any attachment to a mirror in any capacity, thankfully. I mean, that's great because here's the thing, and this is not a shot at anyone. I've met the other guys who were previously in the band, but like they're not really doing anything right now that's on a major radar. And a lot of that has to do with the name. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, I don't know what their personal like uh, like journey has been since then. I don't speak to any of them, nor do, nor do I keep up with their activities at all. But um, you know, it's it's not easy, you know, just to jump out of a, a established brand and just do something new and expect it to have the same kind of impact. You know, it's really rare. Lightning doesn't strike twice. Yeah, you know. And if it does, it's a miracle. So, um, you know, and that's not to shit on them at all. I mean, I, I hope that whatever they cho choose to do brings them success, obviously. But, uh, you know, I, I understand how difficult it can be, you know, at, at, least, at least objectively, you know? Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm a guy who reads yeah. like a ton of music bios. I know we're, we're both Korn fans and like reading, mm -hmm. reading Head's autobiography of when he left Korn. He's like, I'm going from playing major arenas and stadiums to I'm um, playing a bar with 50 people in here. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, it happens all the time. I, I was going to ask you something about when you were saying about your drive to keep this thing going. And I was looking at what you guys are currently up to. You're going to be on two major festivals this summer. So July 10th to 12th in Mansfield, Ohio, headlined by Limp Bizkit, Weezer, Blink-182, Papa Roach. And that's uh, Incarceration ink incarceration because there's tattoos involved with it too yeah uh, and then rock usa in oshkosh wisconsin july 16th to the 18th very similar uh lineup headliners are slipknot rob zombie limp biscuit once again papa roach ice cube like too many to name but i i bring this up not just to promote where you're up to but also because like do you believe in just manifesting shit i because 
you and I, I know, are born the same year, 1986. We grew up when Limp Bizkit and Corn were the biggest thing in the world. Like, did you have a vision of one day I'll be on stage with these guys? I don't know. I don't. I don't know if it was like I'm going to be on the stage with those guys specifically. I think there was always that part of me that uh, subconsciously wanted to be like celebrated by my heroes i think everyone that has idols wants their idol to be like i i I, you know notice me senpai like that whole kind of like attitude which i definitely like had and and still have to a degree you know it's 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 always really cool when bands or anyone that i appreciated you know in my youth they talk to me and like yeah you guys are awesome or i checked your band out sounds great or even just a simple like hey congratulations on what you're doing from someone that I used to look up to still feels like incredible. You know, that, that never like dissipates. Hope you're enjoying this podcast with my man, Frankie Palmieri from Amur. Once again, want to mention with you guys though, that Fort Scott munitions is a manufacturer of multi-federal patented solid copper and brass CNC spun ammunition. It's designed to tumble upon impact in soft tissue. That's their trademark leaves devastating wound channels for faster bleed out and quicker incapacitation. This ammunition was originally developed to innovate and improve on the standard of military-grade ammunition design. It was found that not only did the TUI ammunition outperform competitors in the self-defense industry, but it quickly became apparent that it would be a top contender for hunters alike. With the ammunition being CNC spun, the tolerances are some of the tightest on the market, ensuring that you receive the same results with each pull of the trigger. Fort Scott Munitions is available throughout privately owned businesses in all 50 states, as well as directly online through fortscottmunitions.com, F-O-R-T-S-C-O-T-T-M-U-N-I-T-I-O-N-S.com. Use exclusive promo code BATTLELINE for 15% off your order on all products, only available to listeners of the BATTLELINE podcast. Fort Scott Munitions is a proud supporter of Chris Peranto, Battleline Tactical, and the Battleline Podcast. You've heard Chris say it before. He is not going to put his name or his face on anything that he's not using on the range, not using during his tactical courses, and he stands behind Fort Scott. It's the best ammunition he's used, and all the guys who do courses with him at Battleline Tactical. So check them out. Now back to my interview with Frankie Palmieri from Amur. Anyway, uh... Like, yeah, manifesting shit. So, like, yeah, I mean, I just had a vision when I was really young. I very, but between the ages of 11 and 13 is when I discovered I wanted to do, be in a band, do music and stuff like that. And my whole thing in my mind was, I just want to be on, I just want to be on those stages. It didn't, it didn't matter to me, like, if Limp Bizkit was there or Corn was there or any of these bands, whatever. I just was like, I want to do what they're doing. And that's, that was it. That was, that was the only thing I saw actually was just doing that. And so, um, I, that never left me and that just kind of became like my whole mission. And, uh, now it is really, it is really cool to be able to say like, yeah, I go and I play festivals with my, with the bands I grew up listening to and stuff like that. It's, it's a great feeling. I I can't lie. It's, it's definitely like, in in some ways, definitely still surreal to me that that I'm doing this stuff. You know that all these opportunities have been coming in my direction. You know it's it's awesome. I, it doesn't it doesn't like I'm never like ungrateful. It doesn't escape me at all in terms of what it what how I value it and what it means to me still. So yeah, it's a cool thing. I I don't I don't want to chalk it up by just saying like yeah man I manifested all of this. I think that's kind of like a weird like egocentric thing for a person to say. But I've, I've been very grateful for the opportunities I've been given. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a great, it is a great feeling. I won't lie. It's, again, it's super cool to have my name even somehow associated with, you know, the, those great bands. So it's cool. Yeah. I would just imagine, though, there had to be some sort of plan that you were able to make into reality from fiction at one point, because th- the odds really are or were against you starting out when you think about it. There, Amur is much heavier than all those bands. And there were no bands that were doing what you were doing on on that type of scale until way later on. You know, like, I think if you hear the first Amur album, no one would think this is a band that would be playing major festivals with bands that are more palatable to a mainstream audience. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. It's like, it's like I always wanted to be, like, 
more accessible, like in terms of like people being interested in the band, I guess you just call that being known or popular or famous, or whatever the fuck. I always wanted that to be an aspect of the band. And through like a series of events, it just kind of like became that, you know, we, we, we made a shift con- kind of sonically, like musically and everything, uh, where we kind of elevated ourselves to this place where we were making music that it's still attributed to the scene that we were in, like the whole metalcore, hardcore thing. But it also had a little bit more of that, like, yeah, this is bigger than that. You know, th- this is bigger than the VFW all than. You know what I'm saying? Like it just had that aura about it. And that's kind of the vibe we want, always wanted to give off. Um, at least m- me for sure. You know, that's always what I wanted to happen. So, uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. It's definitely like a cool, strange thing to see a band like us who is not really like marketable. We're not like, of uh, you know, a, what's it called? A fucking, I forgot the name of the fucking, we're not like a liquid metal. Yeah active rock band you know what i'm saying like and, and, and i i like those bands i like a lot i fuck with i fuck with all kinds of music in general but sure my i guess my my point is that when it comes to like us being in that space i don't think it's that strange anymore like back in the day like for sure it would have been like really really weird when we were first starting out but now i think that the band has become something that even if you have never heard us before if you see our live set you can pick up something from it. You can get the energy from that, which is really all I really want is for people to see us and feel it. That's it. You know, like I don't want people to, I I hate the feeling of watching a band or any artist and the songs are just, they're not like palpable, palpable enough to where like you can head bang to it or you're just like staring at them. Like, I don't know where this is going. I, I like, I like the shit that we serve out to be like inviting, you know? So getting to play in those kinds of, uh, arenas and those shows i think is great for us because i think that we create that kind of energy where like regardless of whether you've ever heard us before we want you to be involved in some, in some way even if it's as simple as just banging your fucking head you know that's important to us yeah i mean when you guys go on stage it is a total assault for those 40 or however many minutes depending on if you're headlining or opening and I guess the reason I find it interesting is there's no songs that people could sing along to. There's no like big gang vocal hook. It is just, it is purely you uh, as heavy as possible vocally, musically, sonically, and all that. Uh, as opposed to a kill switch engage who has those type of songs that a mainstream audience could listen to and be like, all right, I could sing to this. I, it's if basically, I think if people played me, look at yourself, I, and I had no background on you, I would not think this is a band that could play stadiums or big festivals. It just doesn't sound like it, but there's something, as you said, that you guys have that others don't. Uh, yeah, I mean, for sure. I I, I just, I don't, I just don't ignore the idea of everyone should be able to get what's happening. Like we definitely bring like that heaviness that you're saying it's like off, like off the charts, heavy and brutal and stuff like that. But I still think we have this element of like, okay, this is inviting. This is not here to just put me in the ground. It's actually here to uplift me in some way. You know, I want everyone to walk away from our set being like, wow, that was, that was fun. You know, like the, all those, all those, all those riffs I heard, all those sections of music, of me being in the mosh pit, whatever it is that people get from it, you know, it should be a positive thing. So, um, that's what I really hope happens when we're in that kind of place. But, you know, I mean, I'm also kind of like, uh, able, not, not, not always able to separate myself from it so it's interesting for me to hear you know comments like you're saying where like you would never expect a band like us to be in that spot in that kind of space and maybe that's true um but i always thought that it made sense you know like that there was always that chance that we should be playing to those crowds in front of those people and yeah we're not a kill switch engage we're like you know i'm not like doing these ballads or these like very i guess more like you're saying more like mainstream kind of like uh songs i mean if i was talented enough i would try to (laughs) but i try to stay in my wheelhouse you know what i'm saying so we just we just make as interesting as a piece of music as we can so that when the fans get a hold of it they want to come see us live you know that's that's really the whole goal yeah i mean the only amir album that even has any sort of clean vocals was felony so it it makes me wonder did you ever want to you know, air, air fingers quotes sell out and do a song that will be played on active rock radio 
because I would assume it's pretty tempting and you you're certainly capable of it. I don't know, man. I, I don't, I don't know if I have uh, spread my wings far enough to make that leap and kind of try and be that kind of band. I'm more interested in just doing what I do well. So the people who are listening, keep listening. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. it would be awesome to like break into that kind of like scene or whatever, but I don't know. I, I don't want to say anything like negative about it because I'm not really a part of it. But from what I gather, like the the kind of bands that do those circuits or, you know, in that world, it's kind of very corporate, you know, like you have to be a certain way, represent a certain kind of ide- ideology or have your music be a certain way to where, you know, people can just they can keep monetizing your shit and keep selling it like like whatever, man. Like I don't, I don't really care about that kind of stuff, you know. I just want to make what I enjoy yeah. and what I what what sets me off. And whatever I enjoy and sets me off, there's a 99.9% chance that the audience will also get the same feeling from it. That's where I start and end with things, you know. If I like the music a lot, then we're good. Like we're in a perfect space. That's all we need to worry about. It's when I start to question the music and I go, I don't know, if this is, I don't know what this is going to be like. That's when things start to go south. So um, the last record, again, was a success for that reason. You know, I was able to truly feel confident in everything, every single track front to back. And we're hoping it's hoping to try and get this, this record to that place as well. We're almost there. We're like, we have like half an album right now that we feel really good about. And the rest is slowly coming together. Yeah, with what you're saying with the kind of creative freedom thing, I couldn't see you being one of those bands as someone who knows you and, and has followed you because like every few months you do something that pisses off the heavy metal media, I guess you would say, because you are yeah. someone who's fascinated with all different types of things and that are controversial. And in this world today, I mean, people know it from this podcast with like the news media in general, but even in your world, everyone is offended by something and you're going to say something that's going to piss someone off. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's not like premeditated. No. You know, I just, uh, I just sometimes fall into like the habit of doing shit that other people do, which is speak their mind. Yeah. <laughs> and because I have a, and because I have a platform, uh, it seems to reach more people than, uh, than the average folk or whatever, you know? So I just, uh, you know, I ruffle feathers sometimes and it's, it's not, again, it's not pretty, I feel like I say things like, Oh, this is going to make people mad. It's usually just some, someone will maybe ask me something and I'll, t- I'll tell them what I think. And then because I was asked something and spoke my mind, I'm also now I'm a, I'm an asshole, whatever, which it's fine. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't, I don't care. Like you can feel however you want to feel about it. It doesn't change things for me. Yeah, uh, you know, whatever. I don't get caught up in what other people think about what I say. It makes no sense, you know. I just say, I just, you know, go about my life and try to be the best person I can be for myself and people I care about. And that's really it, you know. And if other people want to have a concern about what I do or say, that's completely their prerogative. I don't, I don't care. I'm not like ever worried about it. I'm never thinking like, oh, Dan, now I got to deal with this. It's more like, I just hope that the people I care about, you know what I'm saying, don't feel like they're carrying that weight you know that's only that's the only insecurity i ever had because i i i protect the people in my life as best i can from everything that could be ever ever be negative or harmful that when negative and harmful things come towards me which they generally will always always will uh i always feel like i'm having to protect everyone uh in that same uh you know in that same sense or whatever so uh yeah, I mean, it is what it is. I'm not like, again, I'm not someone who chases controversy. Uh, there's things I've done in my career and things I've said that I'm just like, shit. And now looking back, I would have never done or said those things or, you know, I made this, made those choices, but whatever, you know, we all, we all grow and learn at our own pace. And so I just, I'm happy that any mistake I've made or any fuck up that's happened has happened now, has already happened. I yeah. Yeah. Deal with it again. You know what I'm saying? So. Yeah, I mean, every single time that you have those moments in life, you are going to become a better person, become stronger, and be able to persevere through more. It's actually funny that Chris is is away for this episode because there's so much stuff he could chime in with. Like, he's experienced it, but to such a higher degree in that, like... I, so he has stories about when he went on Fox News and they were asking him about his opinion on this administration and what would he say if he was in the same room as Obama. And Chris on Fox News was like, 
everything Chris says, by the way, if you've never heard him, his brother. And so he goes, it, they were like, what would you do if you're in the room with uh, President Obama? And Chris goes, I would choke him out, brother. And next thing you know, he has government agents showing up to his door. And he was telling me about this story. And he's like, I didn't mean choke him out as in like kill the guy or anything. He's like, I meant like put him in a headlock or something. Uh, but he was like, dude, if you don't want to hear that uh, opinion, you know my opinion on the guy. He's like, don't ask me. About, don't ask my opinion on it then. Uh, so it's he's he's just experienced the same thing as you to the point where he at one point deleted his Twitter after hundreds of thousands of followers because he was just like, everything I say is under scrutiny. So fuck this. I'm getting off. Yeah, I think. I think fame is good if you're a person who is old, is like who just never has to speak. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, and I, I wish I had learned that sooner, you know, that you don't need to be loud to be noticed, you know, and you don't need to be necessarily spewing your thoughts, you know, to a world that generally isn't even interested. They're just more interested in you having their beliefs. They just, yeah. want to, they just want to hear what makes their life convenient, you know, and it's not easy to do that. And I feel like the most successful celebrities and anyone who's in the spotlight at all, the reason they stay in the spotlight is because they never talk. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they don't do press and they don't ever go out of their way to do some long winded, you know, magazine interview or anything like that, you know? And so, um, that's kind of my two cents on it all. I, so I, I feel for your buddy. I mean, it sucks that like, you know, to when the world starts to beat down your door for some kind of like, I don't know, frontier justice, you know what I'm saying? Like vengeance for something that isn't even really worth being vengeful about, you know, just these strong uh, emotions people have about what you decide to think and feel is kind of ridiculous. So, I mean, I, I definitely get where he's coming from with the whole bleeding Twitter and just wanting to escape and the whole thing. Cause it is definitely nonsense. And we live in this day and age where like, if you are, if you are a figure or a public figure, whatever you want to call it, uh, and people have access to you, it's like, no, I don't think the human brain was ever meant to like deal with that. No, you know, yeah. having literally like millions of people able to tweet at you or message you calling you a, or whatever, calling you a piece of shit or whatever the hell it is. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't think we were meant to even just substantially deal with that. So, yeah, I totally get it. I, I mean, if that's a whole other conversation, though, with social media and what that really is doing to us as a as as a human race, really. So, I don't know. You want to spin that wheel, but <laughs> yeah, I don't mind getting into it because what you're saying reminds me of. I listen to so many podcasts and interviews and all that stuff. Um. The last time John Stewart was on Howard Stern, he was talking about all this. And the way he put it, John Stewart was like, there's literally people right now in New York City tripping over homeless people while tweeting out that they're outraged someone on Twitter didn't use the right gender pronoun. Like, that's the society we live in. Yeah, it's definitely a, a kind of like a a joke in my eyes, you know, what people choose to focus on in terms of what the issues are with our lives and the world and stuff. So yeah, it's fucked up. But I, love, I, love, I like, I like how John Stewart put it. Cause definitely it's not me. It's as eloquent as you can possibly make it. People are fucking stupid, honestly. Yeah. I, and I do agree with you that like, we weren't meant to have all this and it does affect people because there's, there are those guys who go on Twitter and they want to be loved by everyone or on Instagram. I mean, I think Instagram has gotten even worse where it's just, I have to put up this, it's going to get this many likes and everything is so calculated. And, and no one is any longer like a authentic human being. Everybody is their own brand. And it's like, what's good for the brand? And they they can't just be their authentic self. And I mean, I, that's why I like doing this podcast. That's why Chris no longer does stuff in the mainstream media. And he just called me one day. Actually, to be honest, like I called him, our friend Drew Dwyer, who's a former Marine, former CIA, died. Um, I was the first one to know. And Chris found out from just talking to me that I quit the last podcast I was on, uh, you know, and you knew me from Sirius before that. And Chris was like, why don't we just start our own thing? And I feel like in this day and age, it's the only way to truly be free is to start your own thing. Because it's like you work for a corporation. You're going to say something that's going to ruffle some feathers if you're an authentic person. And I, I, like you can't escape it unless you have fuck you money. And you can just say, I'm going to tweet what I want and not worry about the consequences. Oh yeah. And I mean, also Twitter is the kind of platform where if you don't, if what you're saying on Twitter doesn't match up with their ideology, they just ban your account. Yeah. They just shadow ban you. You know what I'm saying? Like you're just gone. So 
Yeah, I do think that artists and anyone who wants to truly not only be creatively free, but also have their thoughts and just perspective be free chairly, uh, is, uh, uh, is they should probably start their own site, you know, or find a platform that just doesn't even care, isn't worried about your content, is more worried about the fact that you're using their avenue to promote it. So, I mean, there are websites like that that are kind of just free range, let, the, let, let creatives do whatever they want. And I think that's great. And I do agree with you. I do think that is the future um, for anyone who truly wants to like put their stuff out without having to deal with like the red tape and politics of the entertainment industry, you know, in, in general. So, yeah. And it's crazy. Like the stuff you've gotten shit for over the years, because you would think the metal genre, like, dude, it comes from a world where Slayer puts out t-shirts with like offensive images with Jesus Christ and stuff. And like, it's, it's, it's accepted. We kind of know that metal is meant to be shocking and have imagery that's thought provoking and somehow every now and again, you say something that like really gets people, you know, just riled up. And I mean, it's also that they have to put out clickbait headlines. And if you didn't say what you you do say, then they'd have nothing to write about. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I It's hard for me to like uh, make sense of that. I just think that I'm the kind of person that has always been a target for whatever reason, you know, like, I don't know why the energy follows me, you know, and that's not, not to be like a woe is me kind of thing. So I'm not no, mad at it, Yeah. but, um, you know, I just think that the attention I get for things is just up based on the fact that I guess I've misunderstood. People don't understand what I'm about or what kind of person I am. And probably they probably my when they read something I say, it must be connected to a voice in their head. That's negative. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it instantly goes to like, that's, this is relating to a person that I knew that would say something like this. And I fucking hate that guy. So this guy fucking sucks too. And it's like, everyone has their own personal experience in this life and no one person is experiencing it the same way. And I think people just forget that. And because of that, they instantly start to think about me, me, me. How does that, how is it convenient for me? How does it make me feel good? And if it doesn't make them feel good and it isn't convenient for them, then it's something they have to immediately find a way to kill or bring down in some way. So for whatever reason, uh, in terms of the music world, which I don't really give two shits about personally, um, they decide to, you know, make it so that I'm the bad guy, which whatever. And I've had, I've had, I've had, I've had my, my times where I don't want to be that guy. Yeah. And I, I just feel like, why am I being painted this way? And then once I take a step, step back from it, I'm just like, you know what? Like it's not up to me. You know, it, I can, I, I just choose to accept that, you know, other people are not going to understand and are always going to have something to say or some kind of perspective on me. And I just kind of just let it be, you know, don't, don't really think about it too much. Uh, I mean, I know who I am. And again, I said it to you before, but the only pe- things I care about are the people that, you know, are attached to me, you know what I'm saying? That really give a shit about me and vice versa. So, and strangers on the internet, you know, 15 year old kids who think they play guitar professionally. I don't, I don't care about these people, you know? Yeah. I, I think some of it goes to just as someone who's had like a few deep conversations with you over the years, like you are a deeper thinker than people realize and that you come off on the surface sometimes. And like when people really hear about some of the meanings behind the songs that you do, I've always considered you someone who's just an intelligent person and, and sometimes people see the simplicity of what you put out there, but there's, there's always been like a, deeper message to everything you've put out. Yeah. I mean, I appreciate that. You know, it's cool to have anything as you be recognized, you know, in any way. So I definitely say thanks, you know, for saying that, but, um, I don't know. I, I, I don't, I don't like the idea of me talking too highly of myself. No, I get it. Uh, I get if, it. If other, if other people think I'm intelligent, that's awesome. You know, I, I think it's much healthier for me to think that I'm an idiot, you know, <laughs> <laughs> then because then I'm constantly improving, you know, I'm constantly learning. So that's kind of how I view myself. You know, I'm just, I'm just a fucking guy. I'm just, I'm just a guy experiencing all this fucked up shit. Sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's, sometimes it sucks. And when it sucks, I try to make it great. And when it's good, I try to make it better. You know, that's, that's really it, man. It's not really that more complicated for me. I mean, I, I, I put a lot of like the darker stuff in my life into the music and I don't let that, be a part of who I am outside of the music, you know, outside of the music, 
I'm, I, to me, I'm a regular guy, yeah. you know, just focusing on myself and one, wanting to have the best life possible while also just being positive for other people, which I know is really hard to do uh, in this day and age where like negativity is like the thing everyone talks about and everyone seems to focus on. I, I try to not be like that. You know, I try to always look at things like, no, this could be something great. You know, this could, this could turn into something, you know, it, it's an, inc- this might, this might be an inconvenience right now, but it, it just means that it's going to open a door to something that could be good for us. So, you know, that's, that's my whole approach to it or whatever. Yeah. It's, and it's funny you saying like how negativity is, is the thing for some people now with social media. I also think there's like fake positivity is the thing of these people who post a million positive memes every day, but they don't actually do the work within themselves. I mean, they're like, that's why I like Chris because he's someone who really does work on himself every day and is trying to evolve the same way that you're saying, like, I've talked about it on the show. I'm someone who will go to Starbucks for a few hours, journal my thoughts, try to come up with new plans. And it's like self-improvement, being positive, all this stuff that you're talking about. It's not going on Facebook and posting a meme every five minutes. It's actually like doing no, work no, within no. yourself. I mean, I agree fully. I think that that kind of approach to it, where like you're using the internet to promote, like you were saying, like kind of like a fake positivity. I think it's more like, not that it's a fake positivity, but it's like positivity used almost like as a weapon, you know, like shoving it in your face, like, like notice me, notice me, notice me, notice me, you know, rather, rather than it being like truly worried about the well being of others, it's more just about some kind of like ego trip where it's like, yeah, like all these things I'm saying that are good are getting all this attention. And how do I keep that attention going? You know? So I don't, I think that they probably genuinely mean well, it's just that it's, it has little to do with other people and more about what they get out of it themselves, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, it's these people who post about the cause of the day, but it, you, you like, you just want to ask when's the last time you actually went out there and did volunteer work for someone and didn't post about it. Like it's what you do in your everyday life. It is not about the perception that you put out for people to read. Yeah, I, I'm also a big fan of uh, altruism. The only true altruism, or real altruism, I should say, is one that's done in private, in silence, behind yeah. closed doors. Like when you're out there, like talking about the your donations or things you're doing, it's like it's you're not doing it for you're doing it for you. It's for your own clout, so that people can look at you and go, "Oh, that guy's a good guy. That guy's a little better than I am." You know, it's not like it's not truly for to benefit other people. It's just. Like I was saying before, it's kind of, it's like a weapon, you know, like you use this weapon to benefit yourself, you know, and that, that fake positivity or, uh, I don't know, that uh, public altruism to me is a form of that. I'm, I'm trying to find it and I probably won't, but like, dude, there's literally a Bible verse that describes exactly what you're saying. I've posted about it before, but it's about like, just be aware of these people who go around, you know, and have to tell you about all the great deeds that they've done. Like th- those aren't good people. Absolutely. I, I've always known that my whole life. I've, I've instinctively always kind of like what's the, been uh, skeptical of people like that, where I'm like, I don't know, like, I don't see why you would want to just, you know, kind of like, how okay, I guess not brag, but be like, you know, just so like, I uh, can't think of the words right now, but not arrogant either. But it's like, you're just, you're showing off like this kind of per this, this part of your personality that isn't worth showing off. That should just be who you are. That's not the, that's, that's not the part of you. You spotlight, you spotlight your negative shit. So people know you're trying to be a better person, all the good stuff. That's the easy part. That should be your regular like flow of life. You know what I'm saying? Like that shouldn't be the thing you constantly show in people's faces. It'd be, it'd be much better for you to be like, this is the part I'm working on. This is the part that I want to fix about myself. That's, that's real positivity. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if I'm making sense, but no, you completely, you completely are. I, I, yeah. like I said, I think there's just these people now. It's like they follow Gary Vaynerchuk and they repost what he says. But when it comes to doing things in solitude, doing things for yourself, there, I think there's very few people who do that. And some of it has to do with like just the clutter of today that we're not, most people are not in silence. They're never without their phone. And I think like you need that to grow as a person. You need to sometimes be away from all that. And we don't have that. And, and you can never grow if you're not really spending some time evaluating yourself and who you want to be and what goals you want to accomplish. 
Yeah, I, I'm going to say something that is not very profound, but I hope that for <laughs> maybe one of your listeners, it maybe will have a bit of like a gem of truth in it. The only things that really matter, the, the basic things are exercise, diet, reading, reading something, science, something, and anything that, that puts your mind somewhere else for a little while, for a chapter, a book, read a book. And the last part I would say is learn another language. If you focus on those four things every single day, there's no way you won't feel good about yourself and the world around you because you're, you're constantly causing the neuroplasticity in your brain to, to work. And, yeah. and when that's going and you have those fluids running is when you start to actually open up your heart and your mind to yourself and other people, you know, and become mindful of who you are and who, what, what you surround yourself with. So that's my, that's my whole thing right now in general. And that's why I was saying to you when we first started talking, like I'm just here in Dallas, Texas, living with my trainer and just training every day and reading and studying and just kind of focusing on myself 360 while I still have the time because I'll be so busy on the road. And when I'm on the road, it's like you're saying, it's, it's all noise 24 seven, you know, the yeah. people I'm around and the atmosphere. So this is my time to kind of separate myself from that and be able to, like you're saying, it's like a, like find that silence, find that growth, you know? That reminds me of, uh, I, I'm a big Van Halen fan. Like David Lee Roth spent time and he sit in a little apartment in Japan learning sword fighting for a while. He was like, I just mm -hmm. needed to be away from everything and focus on the Japanese culture, which I know that you love as well. And uh, yeah, just yeah. do something different. Which, by the way, is that the language that you know? Do you know Japanese? Um, that's what I'm studying right now. How did I guess, man? How did I guess? <laughs> <laughs> I, I tried. I tried picking it up like uh, in 2014, and I got uh, not that I got really far, but I was studying at least a little bit, and I had some uh, some phrases down and stuff. But now I'm actually getting it more serious, and I got to give a shout out to uh, Duolingo, which I think is the best. Uh, foreign language learning app i've ever used so that's awesome shit. i know and by yeah. the way i know exactly where you're coming from talking about the neuroplasticity of the brain it's something on that i've looked up as well because mm -hmm. I, I mean people need to realize we're living in a society where every single thing you want is at your fingertips and you get this fake dopamine rush from everything so dude there's tons of young kids now that like their entire day is jerking off to porn and playing video games like and it's it's pretty frightening i i like to think that that just that's just part of youth you know when you're just you're basically always in that childlike state you know always wanting to like feel mommy mommy i feel good make me feel good you know what i'm saying like that's just you're in that kind of frame of mind for like a lot of your adolescence and even people are like that into their 20s you know i remember i was like that when i was in my 20s i didn't give a fuck about anything yeah but dude you know it's, it's even it's even weirder now though because you and i are from the generation where like when you were i don't know when you were 10 you had to wait 20 minutes for like a pixelated nipple to show up on your screen and now <laughs> right, dude like right. a, a seven-year-old has access to any act of hardcore pornography they could look up and it's like this is shaping your mind this is transforming the world that you live in absolutely absolutely i mean i, I don't know the the information age is a good thing and right now, I think we're just talking about the negative impact. I mean, that definitely yeah, exists. Yeah, for sure. But I, I also think that regardless of like what people experience as a child or whatever they're at, whatever they do, whether you're saying like yeah, they play video games and jerk off all day, which I'm sure a lot of 18 year old kids are doing, which is totally fine. I think at a certain point, though, it gets old. You know, you're just like it, it, it hits people at different times. You know, like I, I, I know people who when they were like. 15 like yeah man i, I think video games like we're talking about i got a job you know what i'm saying like yeah so it, it happens at different states different people i mean i mean for me it wasn't until like pretty much I hit, when i turned 30 i was like shit like things started to kind of like come together in my mind like what is what is really what am i gaining from this you know i'm playing skyrim which i love that game it's a great game i was playing skyrim for like 10 hours a day it's like what am i accomplishing here you know and like i didn't really dawn on me until I kind of had to step back and realize like, I'm not getting any of these activities. So, you know, I, I, I do, I do feel you though. I think that it's definitely like a, a strange, bizarre time you live in where like, again, like you're saying like a child 
can just kind of like access like all this crazy information, all this like violent or sexual shit. But like, I don't know. I, I do think that you, people mature and as you mature, you realize what's important and that's kind of ends up being what your focus is, you know, but that's just my take. Yeah, I agree. I, by the way, I've never played Skyrim, but you sound like uh, Bobby Lee because Bobby Lee has talked about on his podcast that he, he was addicted to that game and was playing it like an insane amount of hours a day. So it must be just one of those games people get hooked on. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it just becomes like your, your other life. Like you just like, all right, well, my real life isn't where I want it to be. So let's just go do this for 10 hours a day. And that was kind of my escape. And then eventually you realize that all the things that you used to escape are actually hurting you. So that's kind of the conclusion I came to again. Like I it wasn't until I was in my thirties, which I'm in now, but, um, you know, I was like, shit, like this is not doing it. You know, like I need to find like a real way to improve like everything that's going on around me and just having this kind of escapism is not going to do it. So yeah, I still like playing games. Like I still do sure. it as like a very, like a part-time hobby. Like it's not something that can kicks up all my time, but um, you know, I don't know. I, I don't want to go too far for the point you were trying to make, but I do think that it's okay for young people to be in that kind of space for a long time, but eventually it'll catch up to them. And that's when they'll be like, okay, time to turn it off, time to actually do something with myself, you know? Yeah, I especially feel for it coming from you when you're saying that things change for you in your 30s because we're hearing about, like, dude, especially in the rap world, a lot of young artists dying, and you could probably relate to, for a lot of these guys, it's unlimited time on your hands uh, outside of when you have to perform, and for a lot of guys, unlimited access to drugs, unlimited access to sex. And, you know, I could understand how young guys go wild with this and before they really mature and figure out who they are. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, I think it's just natural, you know, even if you're not a famous fucking rock star or rapper or whatever the fuck, you can still be a fuck up until your thirties. I'm saying just be a guy who just like gets drunk and hangs out and fucking dicks off and, you know, doesn't doesn't want to have a girlfriend but like you know tries like fucking everything that moves and it's okay to be that guy you know i'm saying for however long you need to be that person but eventually a switch is going to happen and you're going to realize that none of that was amounting to anything you know it's it's just it's just it's just like kind of like a i call it more of a, a spiritual growth you know a maturity that happens for certain people you know, for lucky people i feel you know but i do think that most people reach that just at different points in their life. Like I was saying before, like, like I knew people when I was younger who like, I'd be like, did you play fucking so-and-so on PlayStation two? They'd be like, PlayStation two. Like what are you talking about? Like I'm, I'm fucking out here selling weed dog. You know, what I'm, trying, <laughs> I'm, try, I'm trying to like build an empire, you know? So it's like, I, I was just, I just had that kind of like young frame of mind for a long time where I just wanted to kind of like fuck around, not take anything too seriously, not even really worry about too much, except for just like, the dopamine effect of everything I was doing, whether it was a gaming or the internet or porn or girls or drugs or whatever, that was more of a focus to me rather than actually improving on who I am and you know, what I am. So, so are you, are you not, I mean, obviously you still play video games, but is none of that a part of your life anymore? Like, you know, you've been pretty open. Your guys experimented with different things. Are you kind of done with that? Is that the new growth that you were talking about? What do you mean like drugs? drugs like you know meeting meeting chicks on the road any of that stuff i mean i'm sure it's all yeah. been out there so that's all i mean i i think i did everything to its maximum uh when in terms of like the rock star shit and now my point of view is that's kind of played out like i don't really think that it's like a a really healthy road to go down you know in terms of your mental and spiritual you know yeah uh journey is concerned uh you know, I, a bit, everyone's different. Everyone's got their own different set of beliefs. You know, I, I just, I'm just personally at a spot where I just think that unless it has true substance, unless I truly know it's going to make me feel good, like long-term, I don't need to do it, you know? And that's the thing with, that's the thing with drugs. That's the thing with, uh, you know, uh, sex and all that stuff is that you get that high, you know what I'm saying? You get that instantaneous high of the activity, and then once it's over, you're back to zero and you don't feel anything and you feel that void grow inside of you until you get the next thing, whether it's the next, you know, groupie you fuck or, you know, drug you take or whatever. Or next time you're, you're you get drunk, it's like 
that's all you're looking forward to. And so that's not really my brand right now. I don't yeah. really care about any of that stuff. I just really want to be healthy and feel healthy and learn and grow uh, as a person, you know, again, 360, like I was saying before. So that's just my thing right now. Yeah, I, I, that's I that's love it. I'm on. No, yeah. I, I think I'm and, on a very similar path and I, I understand completely where you're coming from. And yeah. I also had like a weird awakening around the same time, around 30. Like, I don't know if you had a certain point that just hit a rock bottom or something. I never got into drugs or anything like that. It was just never my thing. But there, there were points in my life where I've been open about it, man. I didn't want to be here anymore. I felt like living life was worthless. I, I, I didn't know the reason for being here. And it actually took like opening up to some really good friends. I did a little bit of therapy, got very into exercise, all the same stuff you're saying that uh, kind of made me open my eyes again and made me see things in a new perspective. And like, you, I really do feel like you have to go through that fire in order to grow. Otherwise, you just, you know, you'll stay stagnant. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it happens. It doesn't like happen overnight. I, I'm not going to say like I woke up, I woke up one day and I was just like, okay, I know what I have to do now to be a better person. I just realized I just started seeing things, the negatives as for what they were. And I ignored them for a long time. Like me sitting at home and like playing Skyrim for 10 hours a day. Like at first, like that was great. And then I realized like, what the fuck is this? Like, that's not anything, you know? And then like, then that happened to me with women where it's like every time I got involved with a chick, it led me to some path. I didn't want to go down. You know what I'm saying? Like some drama or some situation I never asked for to begin with. So I started really questioning that, like what the fuck am I doing that shit for, you know? And then um, you start to worry about like whether or not you're debasing yourself and, and other situations too. So it starts to make you evaluate your friendships, evaluate how you treat your family, how you treat your business. And everything, you know, it comes in, in pieces, you know, and, and I'm not perfect. You know, there's been plenty of times where I fall off the wagon and I just, I just go right back into old habits, whether yeah. it's bad eating habits or like, again, like being addicted to gaming or, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, just trying to fucking bang as much as I can. Like all that shit. It's just like, it's just like, it's escapism. It's just a way for me to avoid what's really going on internally, you know? So uh, I'm just, I'm just way past all that now. And I, I, the, the, the escape to some part, it just kind of like, uh, I don't know. It just kind of grosses me out now. I'm just like, fuck that. Like I'd rather work. I'd rather grow and learn and push myself in that direction, in that, uh, towards, towards that resistance, you know what I'm saying? Where it's like, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard, but the end result will be great. So that's kind of just all I really care about now is challenging myself and pushing myself to be better, you know, which I think everyone is doing. You know, I'm, not, I'm not saying anything, nothing I'm saying is profound or unique or anything. I'm just speaking from my experience that, you know, when I was younger, like we're talking about right now, and I was growing up and up until my 20s, still, I was just like a fucking little kid. I didn't give yeah. a fuck about anything, you know, like wasn't worried about myself or learning or growing at all. I just was like, cool, like, I'm, 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 are we playing games? Are we smoking blunts? Are we fucking dishes? Like, that's all I cared about, you know? But now it's all that shit's kind of old. So yeah, I mean, but you created a life for yourself where you were able to do all that, you know. And I think that it kind of has to do with it, it. It's hard to describe, but I was thinking about it myself with c c the current state I'm in, how I'm starting this whole new podcast with Chris, and you know, I used to work for a big corporation, and I'm not anymore. And I was, and I started to kind of compare myself to other people I grew up with who now have super stable jobs. They are homeowners all that type of stuff. Like they're married. And I realized like I purposely chose a less stable for life for myself. I like to be challenged. I, I, I don't know. I think that everybody is wired a certain way. And some people are more wired for that, like nine to five stable career with benefits. And you were just not one of those guys wired to be that way. And so you chose a life where you actually could choose to play video games for 10 hours a day as opposed to having a clock in nine to five somewhere. You've really never had to do that as an adult. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I took full advantage of all of that, you know, just having that kind of like exuberant freedom to the point where like you just don't even know what the fuck to do with yourself, you know. And I did, like I said before, all the cliche rock star shit you could do, I did all of it, all of it, all the drugs, all the chicks all the party, all the fucking, all the, all the pitfalls of everything, all the bad parts, all that shit. And I survived, uh, all of it, thankfully. 
And uh, here I am today to talk about it and tell everyone that that shit, it's just the hype, bro. This yeah. shit is just the hype. And it's way better to, like I, like I said, focus, focus on the four corners of yourself, which is your, your mental, your physical, your spiritual, and, uh, and beyond that, your friendships, you know? Absolutely. Did you ever go to rehab or anything like that? No, no. I, I have I have kind of like a, a really strong will in terms of like uh substances. Like like if you told me right now I can never eat chocolate ever again, like I'd be like, that's fine. I would never never think about it ever again. Like I, I don't have an addictive personality. I was doing a lot of drugs to medicate myself because I was so unhappy with other things in my life that that was the only way I could get away from it, you know, was to bury myself in in drugs and be surrounded by people who promoted that activity, you know, who were like, yeah, fuck it. Let's, let's get even more fucking down, down the rabbit hole of drugs. You know, like uh, you had, you know, just misery loves company in a way, you know, that whole thing. So, um, it's, but by the way, this yeah. is probably so fucking weird for some people to hear because I'm sure that there's an 18 year old kid listening to this. Who's like, what is, what was this guy miserable about? He's a rock star in a band able to tour the country, play on stages with Limp Bizkit and corn during festivals. Like on the surface, this sounds like a dream. There were things about it that were dreams come true, you know, in terms of the, which, which you say at you- Chicago's finest. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And, and uh, yeah, there were like a lot of dreams that were fulfilled, you know, in terms of the band being known, all the attention we were getting, being recognized as a figure in music and just all this stuff that like was cool. But on, beyond that, my personal life and especially internally, things with the band were so bad that that was the only way I, I saw an out was to just I had was making money. And with that money, almost every dollar I could possibly spend went to drugs. I was like, cool, like, let's get, get me away from this feeling, you know, because there was a lot of uh, feelings of dealing with uh, rejection and uh, just all kinds of just weird um, emotional hangups and a lot of things that had to do with like uh, having this, like, it's a, just a fragile, a fragile very fragile ego and emotional state. I was constantly putting myself in, you know, being worried about the wrong shit. And, uh, you know, I, I look back on it as I was just a, a fucking fucked up, sad, young, young kid, you know, like that's just what it was. You know, I, I just didn't really have any positive reinforcement going on. And that was it for me was, was drugs. But, um, you know, I, again, like looking like I, I'm glad I dealt with it then. Cause I think that that's a lot easier to survive when you're young rather than when you get older and, that ends up being your answer. So I know that that's not good for me. And so I just steer clear from that kind of behavior. I mean, I'm not against drug use. Like I'm not going to say that people shouldn't like experiment or do whatever they want to do with their lives and their body. I'm just saying like, for me, I came to a point where I was just like, this isn't it. You know, I actually remember the last time I like bought drugs on myself. I went, I was staying at a hotel and I just bought like some Molly of somebody or whatever. And I was doing Molly by myself in a hotel room, like, like looking at my laptop and I wasn't getting high. I was just like, this isn't even doing it anymore. And I just stopped. I wow. just stopped using completely because I realized that it stopped working. I was like, something is I was, I was like, something is definitely wrong now because this isn't even doing what it's supposed to do. So I just stopped right there. And um, was it was it was fake possibly? Ago. No, no. I, I mean, my sources were always good, but uh, I just think that I had been using for so long and so much that I just built this tolerance everything that i was putting in my body you know just nothing was doing it anymore so i just kind of stopped completely you know that's a crazy story and i mean it's the first time i'm hearing it so i'm glad uh so i wanted to ask you as well man what's like the writing process for the new album what what type of themes are we going to hear what have you been focusing on every amir album i really do feel like is a completely different experience um well i mean there's a lot of like very defeating lyrics on the album. Uh, like again, what I was saying to you before, like when I start writing for the, the music, I tend to really bury myself inward and look at all the dark parts of my life and things that I feel like I have no control over and things, and, you know, things of that nature. And so that's kind of what a lot of the record touches on lyrically. I mean, every record that Amir has ever made has been kind of a catalog of all like my negative experiences or like negative thoughts. 
and stuff like that. Um, that's just my catharsis, I guess you could say. So this record still falls in line with that. You know, I'm not talking about like rainbows and puppies and shit. <laughs> I'm obviously talking about like my real, my real life and my perspective and things I, I cope with and such and things like that. So, um, I mean, you've yeah, had, you've I mean, had positive songs though, like a voice from below crossover attack. Those are positive themes. Yeah. They're, they're more uplifting themes, but they, they always come from like this place of trying to overcome something dark, you know? And this, this recent album, uh, I don't think really has anything uplifting, honestly. I mean, there, there might be some songs that come through that are kind of uplifting, but this, this record overall is really dark lyrically and, uh, just kind of shows because because you know you were just saying before how like on the outside people see like oh you're you know you just do us rock star shit you play these crazy tours and this and that but like people don't realize all the internal struggle that goes on you know yeah. with me as a person and obviously all the all the other parts of my life being in this business for so long so that's what this record is about so i know i don't know i feel like whenever i talk about it it never amounts to what people get, get from it personally. <laughs> yeah, you're not so going to know I, until you hear it. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, no matter what I say, people are going to take away whatever they want from it. But it, it, it is, again, just like another chapter of the story of me. So I, I like the, the one song that you put out so far. Like, it's short. It's brutal. And I think other people are wondering this, too. Where's that sample from of the guy talking? And I don't know if he's talking about you, like the radio DJ. I feel awkward talking about the source because I don't think people will truly understand that I pulled the sample from the source, not because of the source, but because of what the person specifically is saying. So when people ask me what that's from, I don't answer it. Okay. So I'm not going to answer it now. That's fine. Uh, but is, he, is that guy talking I, about you? No. Okay. He's not. But that's the whole point is that you hear that and you go, wait a minute. That's like, that's ringing way too true for like, so many people, you know yeah. what I'm saying? And it's like, okay, so is that specifically like about him or what's that from? So I, I want to create that, like that uh, experience where you question what you're hearing. Yeah. You know, I don't want you to just be like, okay, I, I get it. You know, or like, Oh, like people will like, if let's say someone does find out where I took it from, or they, they, find it, they, they might not have the intellect to realize that that's not what the song is about. Got you know, you. that's just what the sample is. You know what I'm saying? So, I, I, to save <laughs> face of people not having a true experience of what the song is about, I'd rather just not even tell people where the sample's from because it has nothing to do with the song. The only thing that has to do with the song is that short sentence that that person says to sure. uh, on you know, the Wolf Blitzer character or whatever. Yeah, yeah. That So I don't know, man. I find that super interesting because it's also like I know you're a hip-hop fan and it's like how – Necro will sample some religious Jewish music or something on a track that no one would ever be able to recognize where it's from. And that's kind of the beauty of it is that he's finding these obscure tracks that you're not going to recognize. 99.9% .9 of people have no idea where it's from. So I, I love that just as a music fan. Yeah, yes. I, I'm, see, I'm the exact same way. I love stuff like that. I love when an artist puts something in the music that is actually alien to his own creation. But you know what I'm saying? Like, like yeah. you're saying the samples that, that Necro uses, but it just fits in his vibe so much. You just, you just immediately accept it as a part of him and the music and everything. So I, I love that for sure. I mean, I'm a big fan of like, like Rob Zombie was like always sampling crazy movies and stuff like that. Like I just love, I think it's just so fun. It just makes the music that much more interesting, you know? Yeah, for sure. I, I love everything you've put out over the years, man. And I could see where the where the Thank process you. has grown. No, I, I really do. I mean, I know there's stuff over the years that you are not the biggest fan of, and I get it. I mean, yeah. For, for me personally, just as a fan, I could say that everything from the first album up until Speaker of the Dead, every album, I was like, this is a step above what they've been doing and they keep topping themselves. And then there were, at least for me, this is purely my opinion, two albums in between where I was like, oh, this is like, I don't know. This isn't the same thing where there's a growth on each album. And then the last thing you put out, I was like, all right, this is levels above what they've been doing. And like, it goes back to you being happy with who you're working with. I mean, the DVD that you put out with on the album prior, uh, prior to the last one, it was pretty yeah. apparent that you weren't happy with who you were working with. Like it didn't take a rocket scientist to see it. 
Yeah. I mean, those sections of my life are pretty like self-destructive and and just my behavior and how I viewed things and treated things. I mean, I had a lot of opportunities to be a positive person and to have a positive outlook. And I just couldn't, I just like, wasn't able to, you know, and I, I held a lot of resentment and had an attitude problem that, you know, just really just created like a, a terrible toxic environment, you know, and, uh, I, I, I can't, I can't shoulder all of it. I can't, cause it's not true. I'm not the entire source for all the internal garbage that happened. You know, yeah. when you're dealing with, you know, four to five personalities living in a box together all year round, people are going to pitch each other off. There's going to sure. be people that rub each other wrong. Things you're going to discover about people you're with that you're not going to like the best, the best phrase I can describe it as is, familiarity breeds contempt. Yep. And there was a lot of familiarity and a lot of contempt that grew between everybody in the band. But I know I can't really speak on their growth as people. I know that there were, again, there were a lot of times where I had the chance to be positive and be the person that I sh- could have and should have been in that moment. And I failed. And I know that now, but that's just kind of where it was then. So when you see me on that DVD, I was definitely still that kind of person where like I knew that I knew there were opportunities to be positive and be stoked and just be in a good mood, but I just couldn't bring myself to that place because of X, Y, Z problem number 422. You know what I'm saying? Whatever it is. So, um, you know, but I, I, I don't, I don't relate to that person at all anymore. I, I cringe for sure. Even when you, when you started bringing that up, I immediately went, I was like, Oh God. <laughs> I was like, so, you know, I, I get how that, how that appears to other people. And, um, you know, all I could say is like, you know, that guy, you know, doesn't have a place here anymore in, in my life now, but I, I recognize who I used to be. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it's, I don't want to say it's unfortunate. That's what I'm looking for. It's, it's just like, it's, it's sad to look back and be like, damn, I could have, should, I could have, should have, would have been this way, but you know, it's all I me. Mean, what can I do now? You know, yeah. all I can do is accept it and move on. So I, I think it's important to bring up and I get what you're saying. I think we all like cringe back on old stuff, but being authentic means kind of owning up to that stuff. And it's not, you know, I mean, dude, watch old videos of uh, Joe Rogan stand up. It's an entirely different person. You know, some of it's pretty cringy and it's it's out there. And when you're living a public life, it's going to be out there forever. And, you know, you just you grow as a person. That's the best that you could do. So uh, I should mention, of course, as we're wrapping things up at Frankie Palmieri on Twitter, at Frankie Palmieri, at the Frankie Palmieri on Instagram. Check out him here, of course. Um, if you're in Ohio, July 10th through 12th in Mansfield on the Inc. Carceration Festival, uh, then Rock USA in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, July 16th through the 18th. But it sounds like you, you're taking like amazing steps to grow in your life and doing all this different martial arts stuff, as you were telling me. Uh, dude, it's just it's great to hear. And, and I, like I said, I, I really mean this, although I rarely get to see you. I, like I value our friendship the same way that you're talking about. And it's the same thing with starting this podcast with Chris. He's not someone I saw regularly. And when we spoke on the phone and he said, dude, why don't we just start our own thing? It, it, it worked for me. So sometimes people that you really connect with are not the people that you see every single day. You just know when you, uh, it, it goes to that real recognized real type thing. I think once I first started talking with you, I was like, this is just a genuine person. And those are the type of people I want to talk to that aren't about an image and, uh, you know, trying to live up to, to something that they put out there on an album. You're, uh, people who meet you, I think, will say you're a regular dude, the same way Chris is when people meet him, and that's why people gravitate towards you guys. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I hope that people meet me and they are, you know, it's positive experience, you know. That's the best I could hope for. I, I definitely can only be as organic as the moment allows me to be, you know what I'm saying? So, the breath, bread, breath, man, just trying to make the best of it. <laughs> 
Yeah, no, that's great, man. And thanks for doing this. Yeah. I mean, I've, I watch just about every interview you do just cause I, I get something out of it. And, you know, like I love the interviews Jamie Josta does with you, but a lot of the times it's more about the music business and the ins and outs and, uh, you know, having, uh, 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 creative control and copyright issues and all that type of stuff. And I love hearing all about it, but I wanted to do a little bit more of like an introspective of, who you are because I, I think you're a fascinating guy and hopefully people got something out of it. Thanks man. Yeah. Well, Hey man, it's, it's definitely mutual, bro. I got, I got a lot of love for you and I'm happy to connect and I'm sure, you know, next time we cross paths, it'll be, it'll be a good one for sure. Thanks man. And Oh, one last thing I should ask you about, cause you've been like teasing this out on Twitter. You're going to put out a book in quite a few years away. Yeah. My, my plan is to uh, take like all the, all the, things I've collected, memorabilia, all the tour stuff, all the information, all the press, everything that uh, encapsulates the 20 year career of Amir, I'm going to put into a book in 2023. And it'll be a breakdown of what all the tours were like, what all the album cycles were like, what all the lyrics mean, photos, rare photos, like all kinds of stuff no one's ever seen before or even thought to ever look at. So uh, you know, I plan to put that out definitely in when the 20 year mark of the band. That's, that's the goal. I probably won't get the chance to really work on the book for real until 2022 when I have all the content together, you know? Well, will you talk to any of the former members who you haven't to get their perspective on things? I've thought about it. I thought about doing also a DVD that is like a true like bio on the history of the band. Uh, so who knows that that might all come together is definitely a thought I've played with in my, in my head before, but we'll see what actually comes out. Yeah. I mean, there's just been so many people who have been in and out of, of what you've done. And I mean, I think they've all brought something unique to the table and I think they absolutely, they, they probably appreciate absolutely. you coming on here and not bashing anybody, but I could say like meeting guys like, you know, Mike Cobb, who was in the band for several years, like incredibly talented drummer. No, he's one of the most talented people I probably have ever known. He just, uh, he just kind of like, I don't know. I, I can't say anything too. No, I, I know uh, where you're coming from, but it's like a lot but of these guys have, have a ton of talent and, yeah. and, and it's, they're part of the reason that people like myself gravitated towards the band. It, 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 they all brought something to the table. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. I haven't spoken or seen Mike, man, in like nine years, so I'd have to, I'd have to track him down. <laughs> yeah. I just mean all, all these guys, you know, because I think putting yeah. out a book, people would probably want to even hear from the original guys in Connecticut. People want to hear from the new guys. And, uh, I, to me, that would make an interesting book just as a nerd of the band. No, yeah, for sure. I mean, I, again, like I definitely have played around with the idea in my head of, of having every single person that's ever been involved put like their little, like, you know, stamp into the history of all this I mean, rightfully so but we'll see i mean i i those relationships unfortunately uh are non-existent at this point so it would take a little bit more of uh you know putting some butter on that on that on that dog to get it fucking smacked if you get what i'm saying yeah <laughs> my terrible analogy <laughs> well i mean you got plenty of time so you yeah, know, you yeah. never know what the future holds yeah you're right you're right man we'll see what comes together Awesome. Well, I, I truly appreciate you taking the time to do this, Frank, because I, I think it was a really good, positive interview that people are going to get something out of. So thanks, man. Yeah, man. Likewise. I uh, Good luck with everything, and I, I'm sure I'll talk to you soon. I hope you guys really enjoyed that. I know it's a little different than what we normally do. We have a lot of like special ops guys on the show, and we've had athletes on. We'll probably have more musicians on and, you know, we didn't get into anything political because there's no reason to on this one. Maybe a little bit. We got into like outrage culture on Twitter, but beyond just being a huge fan of Amur, I've always found Frank to be really authentic guy. And I think he felt he uh, fits the bill of what we're trying to do on this show. So with that, once again, want to let you guys know that Fort Scott Munitions is a manufacturer of multi-federal patented 
solid copper and brass CNC spun ammunition. It's designed to tumble upon impact in soft tissue. It leaves devastating wound channels for faster bleed out and quicker incapacitation. This ammunition was originally developed to innovate and improve on the standard of military grade ammunition design. It was found that not only did the TUI ammunition outperform competitors in the self-defense industry, but it quickly became apparent that it would be a top contender for hunters alike. With the ammunition being CNC spun, the tolerances are some of the tightest on the market, ensuring that you receive the same results with each pull of the trigger. Fort Scott Munitions is available throughout privately owned businesses in every state, as well as directly online through fortscottmunitions.com, F-O-R-T-S-C-O-T-T-M-U-N-I-T-I-O-N-S.com. Use the exclusive promo code BATTLELINE for 15% off your order, only available to listeners of the BATTLELINE podcast. Fort Scott Munitions is a proud supporter of Chris Peranto, Battleline Tactical, and us right here at the Battleline Podcast. And uh, yeah, I mean, I get emails from some of you guys saying, how could I support the show? People want to donate, see if we have a Patreon, and we're not doing any of that. Uh, Chris and I kind of came to the uh, decision that we didn't want to beg the audience for money or anything like that. I think it's kind of corny. So, I mean, if you want to support us, Buy something from one of our great sponsors. I mean, whether it's Ned or Fort Scott or any of the other sponsors on episodes and use our promo code, that's really what helps us out. And we're only taking sponsors that we truly believe in what they're doing. So it helps us. You're going to love what you get as well. And uh, yeah, if you have any emails, any uh, questions for the show, just email us. It's battlelinepodcast at gmail.com. Yes, Chris will be back next episode. And uh, let Frankie know what you thought of the interview. I'm sure he'd love to hear your feedback at Frankie Palmieri on Twitter, at the Frankie Palmieri on Instagram. I'm of course at Ian Scotto uh, at Battleline Pod on Twitter, at Battleline Podcast on Instagram, the Facebook. We're getting up there, man. We're getting up to like between 3,000 and 3,500 likes. And keep in mind, we just started this thing less than three months ago, so. I'm really proud of what we're doing. Chris is really proud of what we're doing. And we love hearing the feedback from you guys. Um, You know, I know certain episodes and certain guests you guys gravitate towards more than others. But I think they're all bringing something different and unique to the table. And everybody we've had on has some sort of inspirational story that I think you'll get something out of. So, uh, yeah, we'll be back on Monday. Chris will be back on Monday. A lot of more great stuff happening right here in February. So keep subscribed to us. And thanks again. That's all for this week's Battle Line podcast, but we'll be back on Monday with more American Straight Talk, so make sure you're subscribed. And keep up with the show 24-7 on Facebook and Instagram at Battle Line Podcast. Also on Twitter at Battle Line Pod. As always, never quit. Never quit.